nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. And this today's session is going to be led by you guys. Some of you have met Peter before, are familiar with Dr. Peter Kazarinoff, and uh, and he's actually at uh, uh, Portland Community College. Um, uh, and he's a faculty there in engineering, uh, and he, his uh, able able assistant this week will be uh, Rich Hill. Uh, if you came to our intro workshop series, you saw Rich there. Uh, he's a master electronic and nanotechnician at Erie Community College um, and does a great job in, um, in, in our demonstrations for these, um, these workshops. Peter? Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Um, so you can notice that uh, there are a couple of us here. Uh, I'm Peter Kazarinoff. I've got the blue background. I teach engineering and engineering technology at Portland Community College. And um, we've also got Rich Hill here. Uh, Rich is wearing uh, the clean room suit. And yeah. there he is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also we've got uh, the Erie profilometer there on Zoom. Uh, so that's a, a Rich's profilometer uh, out near Buffalo, New York. And um, that's also going to be part of our uh, presentation today. So you can uh, send me an email at peter.kazarnoff at pcc.edu if you have any questions about thermal evaporation or uh, anything else related to nanotechnology education for technicians. Uh, Rich's uh, email is hill at ecc. Uh, .edu, and if you've got questions about the low-cost thermal evaporator setup that we're going to talk about, uh, please definitely get in touch uh, with Rich. Uh, we'd love to uh, hear from you. Uh, and we're going to hop into a review of uh, vacuum science. So last week, uh, the session was on vacuum science, and we want to use that kind of as uh, background when we start talking about uh, thermal evaporation this week. Uh, so Rich, do you want to uh, take us into a little review of uh, vacuum science? Sure. So what some of the stuff that you guys had picked up last week is vacuum um, is the removal of gas molecules from a chamber to achieve a pressure lower than atmosphere. So a lot of things that are going on in the world today is for manufacturing of, say, uh, nanotechnology or micro machines, it needs vacuum. So you had a review of that. You, you heard that last week and this week we're talking a little bit more about it. So atmospheric pressure is normally 760 torr and that is one atmosphere typically at, at, at uh, sea level. Here in Buffalo, I think we're, well, about 746, it says on my um, gauge up there. So we have ranges, you got low vacuum, which is rough vacuum. That's what we're going to use today when we do our demonstration, but atmosphere through 10 to the minus 3 tour. You got high vacuum that ranges from the 10 to the minus 3 down to 10 to the minus 6. Then ultra high, 10 to the minus 6 down to low as you can get. People try to get very, very low sometimes. Okay, next. So vacuum pumps, I put a little bit of table here of uh, vacuum pumps. So typically your mechanical rough pumps are your rotary vane, you got diaphragm, scroll pump, and dry piston pumps. That's a few examples. Um, we have some, for high vacuum, we have some oil diffusion pumps, cryogenic pumps, turbulent turbo pumps, and sublimation pumps. A lot of the stuff we use here at, in my clean room, we use the, the turbo pumps to get to our high vacuum range. And we use scroll pumps and diaphragm pumps and rotary, rotary vein pumps for rough vacuum. Next. So here's a little chart that kind of shows what the gauges are, where they go for the ranges. So when you're talking uh, low range here, we got uh, piezo and diaphragm gauges and uh, the board on gauge. So the board on gauge, I do have a list that's coming up, but that's one of your least expensive gauges you can get that can tell you that you are pulling a vacuum. Then convection, convection and Pirani gauges and capacitance manometer gauge. Those are typically what you see a lot used in like in my facility. 
we use those to get pressures for the low pressures for rough vacuum. And then we get high vacuum. You have some cathode gauges and hot cathode and cold cathode. We use those here for um, the high vacuum ranges. And then it goes on from there. But those are a few examples. You're welcome to look at that at any time when you see the slides and look up how they work and what they do. <laughs> Next. So here is a page where I put a whole bunch of vacuum components on. So these are things that are used to create the vacuum system. This is how we get things connected to each other. So I decided to put on here some visual aids to see what you have. And then in the lower left, we have a clamp. And next to that, we have centering rings. That is what we use to connect all the piping together and get all our gauges together. And there's various types of those, but that is pretty common in in, in uh, this area for us, like at our in our clean rooms, to use that type of uh, piping and clamping. Next, <clears throat> okay. So we have a few a uh, little list here of some cost of vacuum pumps. You can see we got rough vacuum pumps, fifteen hundred to twenty two thousand. In high vacuum, 3,500 to 50,000. Some of this stuff is, I have listed here, the low ranges are remanufactured pumps because we have purchased some remanufactured pumps and they've done very well for us. And then you have gauges that range from $50 to $1,000 for rough vacuum, high vacuum, 150 to $1,000. So you see that a lot of them cost the same, but you also have to keep in mind that you need a rough gauge, you need a high vacuum gauge, you need an ultra high vacuum gauge. So they just compound on down cost wise. And then the higher, the higher cost obviously is going to be, you know, your best accuracy in a lot of cases. Then components, it all depends because I also include the chambers here. So chambers can cost a very lot. They can cost a 15, 20,000, even more. But some small components, like on my machine here, I have a little, a little vent knob that I use to vent the system, and that's that's something that's like twenty five dollars or forty bucks or something. And then you got the little centering rings, which can be very inexpensive, but you have to replace those. So that's why that range is just so so broad. Next. So next we're gonna pump down the chamber. Rich, do you wanna kind of center us? Like, where are you? Why are you wearing all that stuff? And uh, what are you gonna do next? <laughs> well, I'm wearing the clean room guard because I'm going to be, right now I'm in a chase, one of our chases next to our clean room. And then I'm gonna be in the clean room. So the stuff I'm wearing is because I'm trying to protect our clean room and the stuff inside from me bringing in all kinds of stuff that we don't want in there. Uh, our clean room here at ECC is a class 10,000. So what that means that in a cubic foot of air inside our clean room, there's no more than 10,000 particles. So we have a pretty sophisticated clean room here and I'm wearing all this stuff to keep it safe from debris that I bring in because humans are the worst thing for a clean room. We're always contributing something i think that's yeah, so probably we can uh, see, see the <laughs> cart now looks good all right can is this a pretty good view um this is what i'm going to place inside it's a slide it's got some tape on it if i can find a good spot there we go use the backdrop of the pump so i have a slide here i have some tough um tape on it and then this is what I'm going to put in there and we're going to coat it and then I'm going to remove the tape so that we can see what we deposit so I'm going to lift I'm going to place the glass slide underneath my uh, between my electrodes underneath my tungsten wire that has two little clips on it I don't know if I can hold this up with these gloves very well, so you can see probably not, but it's a little tiny clip. 
that we're going to evaporate and cause it to deposit on our glass slide. So I'm gonna put the cover on now. Now I need to make sure that all my vents and valves are closed. All right, I have two, two valves here, a butterfly valve, and I have my vent valve. I made sure those are closed. Down here is my transformer, I mean my, um, here's my transformer on this side. I've got a little meter here to tell me what kind of current we're gonna be running. Turn that on so you guys can see that. All right, hopefully you can see it. If not, here I have my potentiometer that's going to adjust my voltage for me so I can start out at zero, send current from my transformer up into my electrodes that will in turn heat up my tungsten wire at some point that aluminum will start to melt and evaporate. And then you'll see my glass chamber get coated in silver or in aluminum so that you won't be able to see it anymore. But hopefully it's a decent show as we go through this process. Then over here is my gauge that will show us or show me that when we get down to roughly, uh, this gets us down to around 50 millitor, 40, 44 millitor, takes about three minutes. So that sums up basically our system. Now I'm going to go ahead and pump down. Uh, and I think that Peter wanted to talk about some other things while we did this. And like I said, Peter, take about three minutes or, or so. So once I turn it on, you might hear some noise through the mic, but then that it's on now, everything's closed. I have to open up my butterfly valve. Okay, we're off and running. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So Rich started uh, pumping down the chamber and later in our presentation, uh, we're gonna give a demonstration of thermal evaporation, uh, but loading up the chamber and pumping down the chamber, uh, that's uh, the first step. Uh, so Rich, can you talk a little bit about uh, all the components uh, that we just saw? Okay, so the components you can see we got A is our chamber. So the chamber, this chamber is made of Pyrex, but you can also purchase a chamber made of glass, um, just not Pyrex, it's regular glass, but you'll notice that it'll be thicker. So we have a few of those, but the Pyrex is nice because it's, it's not as thick, so it's a little bit more clear when you look at things and watch things. So then you got B, the vacuum pump. Now that pump in the image, that is a scroll pump. Uh, that pump I choose to use and I do demonstrations for students because it makes the system just a little bit lighter to, to haul around and lift because it's not as big and bulky as the oil rotary vane pump. Then we have a gauge C on the right there. That gauge is a Pirani gauge. Uh, it's one of the little more expensive ones. They make all different prices. Um, this one I use that we have here because it's a little bit easier to see sometimes uh, when using for like this type of demonstration. So that's the one I, I like to put on there. Then if you can see uh, D there, that little knob, that's that little vent valve that I was turning to make sure it was closed on my system here. That's how I can vent the system. If I don't vent the system, there is no way I'm gonna get that glass jar off of there that bell jar without breaking it. It's just gonna be just stuck. There's no way. And then E is pointing to the butterfly valve. That's just a means of me separating the pump from the chamber. So I can close them off, keep them individual if necessary. And then D is, no, the F is showing some of the piping that we have going on here. And then we also have G that shows the reducer that I had to put on there to connect the piping to my 
pump. And that's basically the rundown of our system and what it looks like and what we have here in front of us here. So why that uh, system pumps down, we're gonna talk a little bit about the fundamentals of thermal evaporation. Uh, what is it and how does it uh, work? Uh, so what exactly is uh, thermal evaporation? And I'm gonna start off with an uh, analogy uh, to a foggy bathroom mirror. So uh, right here, you see an image of a foggy bathroom mirror, and then somebody with their finger has written out the word condensation. So when thermal evaporation is done in micro and nanotechnologies, uh, that uh, same process is happening as the process where your bathroom mirror gets foggy when you take a hot shower. Uh, when you take a hot shower, uh, some of that water uh, is steam in your bathroom and uh, your mirror is a uh, relatively low temperature uh, compared to that steam. And so that steam will condense and go back to the liquid phase on the mirror and to our eyes that looks uh, like fog. And when we thermally evaporate metals, uh, like Rich is gonna show later, uh, we're using that same sort of process. We're heating up a metal to a temperature that's high enough in order to vaporize it. And then uh, that metal vapor condenses on uh, surrounding objects like the microscope slide that Rich showed uh, with the pieces of tape. How this works is that add atoms, these are the atoms from the metal that we're evaporating, uh, sort of hop around until they form a bond uh, with the substrate. And how long these add atoms are mobile uh, is critical to the quality of the film that's created. And some of the factors uh, that lead to that quality include the energy of the incoming add atoms, the temperature of the substrate, and the flux and energy of ions and electrons in the uh, system. Uh, when you will see uh, Rich's system run, uh, he's gonna be running at a rough vacuum pressure and there are going to be a lot of add atoms uh, that are created in the chamber all at once when he ramps the current up uh, to a, a sufficiently high uh, level. Um, and that's gonna kind of um, lead to sort of like a poof of the aluminum on the inside uh, of the chamber. Now there are uh, about three main types of uh, physical vapor deposition uh, techniques and then a couple other uh, less common techniques. Uh, the three main common are thermal evaporation that we're talking about today, uh, sputtering uh, that you'll learn about in another session, and laser ablation. And less common physical vapor deposition techniques include MBE, which is molecular beam epitaxy and ion plating. In this seminar, we're talking about thermal evaporation. And there are two main ways uh, to heat up the metal to the gas phase. One way uh, is just uh, thermally, and that's usually done by running a current uh, through a boat, a basket, or a wire. And the other is using an electron gun in order to heat a material that's on the inside of a crucible. The reason that Rich has to pump down the bell jar is that as pressure decreases, the vaporization temperature of the metal decreases. If we tried to do this at room temperature, we'd have two effects. One is we'd get a whole lot of, excuse me, tried to do this at room pressure. Uh, we'd get uh, uh, two effects. One is that we'd get a whole lot of contamination and uh, the other is that Rich would need to heat up his filament to a very, very high temperature. Um, but as uh, the pressure on the inside of that bell jar decreases, the temperature that the aluminum on the inside of that uh, bell jar vaporizes at is gonna go down. So you can see on the left, a plot of uh, temperature versus pressure for different metals. Uh, what we can see on uh, that plot is that metals like aluminum, gold, chromium, and uh, silver, which isn't on the plot, can be thermally deposited. 
uh, but other metals with relatively high melting points like molybdenum, tantalum, and tungsten uh, can't be practically thermally uh, deposited. And uh, these metals, which we sometimes call refractory metals, uh, are used in uh, the bolts, boats or the holders of um, uh, the metal that will be uh, thermally evaporated. And it's very difficult to evaporate metal alloys. And the reason for that is that different metals have different uh, vaporization temperatures. And so if you've got a mixture of two different metals in the same basket or the same boat, uh, the metal which uh, evaporates at the lower temperature is going to uh, come off first and you'll get a layer of that. And then uh, the next uh, metal will come off last and you'll get a layer of that uh, rather than have an alloy. So in thermal evaporation, the material is heated until it's uh, vaporized and usually uh, low pressure is used. Uh, but Rich has got this amazing setup that he can do this at roughing pressures, uh, which is much lower cost uh, than using high vacuum. And uh, previously, Rich showed how much more expensive attaining high vacuum is than just uh, rough vacuum. Uh, the evaporant leaves the source in the line of sight. So uh, Rich has got uh, that sort of coil of wire and the aluminum is going to deposit all over uh, the bell jar uh, through uh, line of sight. So it won't just be the microscope slide that's got the tape on it. The whole bell jar is gonna end up being coated. And so you can up, end up with uh, shadowing techniques. Uh, so sometimes uh, filling high aspect uh, ratio trenches and devices is difficult uh, with thermal evaporation. Uh, here's a schematic of what the inside of uh, Rich's bell jar uh, sort of looks like. On uh, the upper right hand side, uh, you can see that uh, there's this vacuum chamber that has a dome at the top. On the inside of the vacuum chamber is a um, uh, voltage supply that holds uh, the material to be evaporated. And that was a little coil of wire that you saw in uh, Rich's uh, camera. Uh, then the substrate is uh, held or placed in uh, the chamber in some way. And then many vacuum chambers also include uh, quartz crystal monitors. And these uh, monitors can monitor how thick uh, the film is. In this demonstration, Rich is going to use a surface contact profilometer uh, to show how, quick, uh, how thick the film is. On the lower right hand side, uh, you can see an example of uh, electrodes uh, that will hold uh, the boats, the baskets, or the wires uh, that are uh, um, going to be thermally evaporated. Uh, this uh, particular electrode set has four different locations uh, where baskets uh, are put in. And then you put in your metal on the inside of those uh, little spirally uh, baskets that you're going to thermally deposit. Uh, in addition to baskets, uh, you can also use uh, filaments that Rich is using uh, or uh, boats. And on um, the sort of right-hand side of those little pictures, you can see two gray boats. And those boats are usually made out of those high melting temperature refractory materials like tantalum and molybdenum. This is an example of uh, the entire setup. And this would be a much higher cost setup uh, than uh, the setup that Rich has. And the reason for that is that this setup shows a turbo pump which is a high vacuum pump, as well as a mechanical uh, roughing vacuum pump. Uh, in addition, there are a couple of other gauges shown here, like the ion gauge that's more expensive than the gauges uh, that Rich has on his uh, evaporator. Uh, but things that are common include the AC power supply, uh, like the transformer Rich was talking about, and uh, that W filament that stands for tungsten filament, that's kind of like uh, the little um, uh, curly Q strand uh, that Rich had in his uh, setup. Uh, besides doing regular thermal evaporation, uh, the other uh, main type is E-beam evaporation or electron beam evaporation. 
in electron beam uh, evaporation rather than using um, a current to heat up a boat or a filament or a basket, uh, what you use is high energy uh, electrons. And those high energy electrons are created from an electron source, kind of like the source that's used in scanning electron microscopes and is accelerated and guided uh, towards your material source. And uh, the material source is typically held in these high temperature crucibles. And uh, you can have a very small volume uh, be melted at a time because you can highly focus uh, the electron beam. And this uh, decreases the amount of contamination. And you can also have relatively high evaporation rates in E-beam evaporation. But E-beam evaporation is uh, quite a bit more expensive. Uh, than uh, just regular thermal evaporation using resistively heated uh, boats. So uh, thermal evaporation uh, is widely used in the semiconductor and microelectronics industry, uh, but it's used in places um, other th uh, than those industries as well. So on the left-hand side, you can see a silicon wafer uh, that has been used in a semiconductor fab and thermal evaporation is used to lay down uh, metals and other materials as part of the semiconductor uh, manufacturing process. But uh, in the middle picture, you can see some mylar balloons and thermal evaporation is also used to deposit aluminum alloy on the surface of a plastic substrate in order to uh, make the material that goes into those balloons. Uh, aluminum is a great barrier against uh, gases leaking, and helium has very small atoms, so it can uh, seep through most uh, typical polymers. So if you lay a layer of aluminum on the inside, uh, that'll prevent um, the gas atoms uh, from leaking out of your balloon. On the right-hand side, you can see a Doritos chip bag, and in the food packaging industry, thermal evaporation is used uh, to put um, uh, metal down on food packaging surfaces, and that uh, decreases uh, the uh, food spoiling uh, because it prevents um, uh, moisture from getting on the inside of uh, the package. So uh, before we move into our demonstration of thermal evaporation, uh, from Rich. Uh, are there any questions over chat or over a microphone about our fundamentals of uh, thermal evaporation? All right, so if any questions come out, you can just shout them out over a microphone or um, write them uh, in the chat and we'll uh, make sure to get to them. So next, uh, Rich is gonna uh, go through uh, what he's gonna do to do the thermal evaporation. And then you're actually gonna uh, see it live here. Uh, you should be able to see uh, Rich's camera where uh, he's showing his thermal evaporation setup. Uh, so take it away. Hello. All right. So we're back. So as Peter had mentioned about us keeping this as a low cost system, so I can let you know that this system here, uh, I priced it out and it's under $5,000. And later on, I believe we're going to talk a little more and show you some other evaporators like the one we have inside our clean room. Um, but I'll give you the idea what this one costs compared. We'll, we'll see the comparison later. So what I'm going to do is I've got, like Peter mentioned, I've got my little clips up here on that wire, a tungsten wire. Down here, I have my knob that I'm going to turn and put that current through. So we're going to try to do this at a slow pace. And we're probably about the limit of pressure, 16 and a half millitors for this system. It's been pumping a while, so obviously it can go down to whatever the pump's capable of. So this is really good for us. We're going to hopefully get something that looks pretty clean when we put it under the profilometers um, camera. So I'm going to start to turn this up and I'm going to start to send some pressure or some current through our tungsten wire.
Right now I'm about five amps. We still aren't generating enough current to see our glow start. Let's take it up. About 10 amps right now. I'm at 12. I believe we've got to get up to near 30 when we see something happening. 20, 25. Thirty. No. Well, Thirty-five. Oh, here we go. I'm up about thirty-seven. We got the glow starting. So hopefully that is showing up. So now I'm going to take her up to about forty. I think that's about when we're looking to see something happen. We're at thirty-five. It's starting to evaporate. Let's see it coloring. Forty, boom, just went. I don't know if you saw it, but it just went. And you can see it's coating up. Now I'm going to turn it down. All right, that was our demonstration. Yeah, it turned it turned all cold in it. I don't know if Peter wants me to take the sample and vent the system right now. I'm not sure what kind of order we want to go in for that. Yeah, so you should be able to see now that the bell jar has this uh, silvery mirror appearance, and that's because Rich just thermally evaporated aluminum all over uh, that jar. Yeah, so Rich, as long as the filament is uh, cool, you can uh, go ahead and uh, vent the chamber. And then while it's uh, venting, uh, let's talk about uh, the cost of uh, the setup that you've got there. OK, yeah, so like, like I said, we got about the um... $5,000 here. And uh, Peter's got the, the list up there that shows what we got. The, the RV3 is a rebuilt rough vacuum pump. The base plate, I had um, borrowed the design from uh, Nancy over at Normandale. Uh, she had a company that they had already worked with. I got the information because we work with Nancy and we were able to have them make us the base plate with the holes in it so that we can put feed throughs in. Then we had to buy the vent valve, which you can see there. Okay, I guess I was off. That one's quite expensive. <laughs> but um, that little vent valve is 130 bucks. Then we got the isolation valve, that butterfly valve, that's 300. You don't have to use a butterfly valve. They make several different types of valves. You, there's, I'm sure there's a one that costs a little bit less out there that can be used. The, the, um, component, the, isolate, yeah, the components, roughly 440 bucks worth of components, the piping and the, um, the clamps and the centering rings and our right angles, our reducers, that kind of stuff. Then you can see the bell jar there. And, oh, the transformer, I missed that. The transformer uh, was a bit expensive. The bell jar was not too terrible at, uh, from Fisher Scientific. The power transformer was pretty cheap. I think, okay. And then we got the feed throughs, two of them for $460. Then our sources are pretty inexpensive. And our, um, our material, this is half, this jar here is like half full of those little clips that I purchased to do this. So needless to say, for the amount of money for that, I can do a lot of evaporating. <laughs> But then you can see it was about $5,000. So we hope to even figure out other 
levels of pressure we can go to to even bring the cost down. I mean, I'd like to see it down to 4,000 or maybe even if we can get it down even a little lower than that would be great for a lot of opportunity for, for colleges and high schools to be able to build something like this. And Rich, which one of these components um, might there be at a community or a technical college uh, sort of lying around if they've got an electronics program or a machining program or something like that? Now, yes, that's a good question because a lot of community colleges probably have the variable transformer in a, a physics class or something like that, maybe in, in an electronics or electrical engineering <clears throat> type class. Um, they might have a bell jar in the physics class because there's a lot of, they do some vac vacuum experiment, uh, experiments. So then there might even be a, a small vacuum pump. So it, it, you can cut the cost down and get some of that stuff by borrowing it. And then you can just try it. I mean, it's nothing, you know, there's nothing to lose to see then, then maybe if you have to, then, then you start to figure out or you contact someone like uh, Peter, myself, or anybody associated with NPDP to, to, to help you out here with these, uh, what maybe you can change to get you off the ground. Um, as far as the, a lot of the other stuff, you would probably have to buy that. Um, you might find a valves, some valves, but I'm not sure. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks, Rich. So I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing and hopefully the system uh, has been vented and you'll be able to take uh, the bell jar off. Okay. Yep. It's vented. <laughs> put this down so it's all nice and shiny and and now i've got to clean it <laughs> so that i can do this again everything here you can see our feed throughs have gotten coated the tungsten wire is still intact and our sample so here's the mirror we made and point it right at the camera. So what I'll do is I will start to pull off these. There's one pulled off. So now we have several spots that we will be able to measure our product. And I'm, we're not gonna go crazy and measure all over the place, but. All right, so there is our little finished product of um, glass and deposited aluminum so that we can measure something. Anybody have any, any questions to blurt out here? Let me put this bell jar back on so I don't drop it on the floor moving this cart. What kind of tape do you need to use? Uh, the tape that I use is Kapton tape. Uh, you want it, you want to, you want a tape that is um, more of like this, you know, Kapton tape, more of like a plastic, um, so that it's not going to be a big, big outgasser and have a lot of trap material in it, is what you hope for. Thank you. Yep. Rich, does it matter what kind of uh, slide you use? What kind of glass you use? Um, no, it, I don't think it will. Um, we, we use the glass slides because, well, they're inexpensive. But um, someday, I guess what we're going to have to try here is going to try to do like a lift off process. So we can use some photoresist, deposit some uh, aluminum, and see, see how that goes with us on, on a silicon wafer, maybe. <laughs> Any other questions about our thermal evaporation so far before we uh, go into measurement? And I will turn off the camera so I can 
uh, move this and not make anybody dizzy. <laughs> I had a quick question. Are there any issues with the buildup of metal on the inside of the dome? Does it flake off after a certain amount of runs or does it just adhere for? Uh, it has pretty good adhesion, um, but usually all I've done so far is use this for demonstration purposes. So typically I do one demonstration and then I clean it. And, and actually, that's actually good because if you only have the one layer after one demonstration, it makes it easier to clean. The, the thicker it gets, the more difficult it can be to get the aluminum off the glass. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. And Rich, how do you clean it? Uh, do you use a special solvent or a special chemical? I use a, a glass cleaner that is made to clean bell jars that I had purchased from Ted Pella. Um, uh, forgive me for not knowing what it's called. I know it has a Ted, Ted Pella sticker on it, so I'm sure they must buy it in bulk or something and package it or something like that. But yeah, I just use that and a little DI water and um, some clean room paper, uh, not paper, but you know, um, clean room towels. And if I have to, I can get a little more aggressive and use like a Scotch-Brite pad. Great, thanks. So uh, Rich is sitting down at a surface contact profilometer to measure how thick uh, the aluminum film is on the microscope slide. Uh, but real quick, uh, before he makes that measurement, uh, we're going to talk about what is a surface contact uh, profilometer. So while uh, Rich is sticking uh, the slide in there, uh, surface contact profilometer uh, uses a typically diamond tip probe that physically contacts the surface, kind of like an old record player and uh, that tip is drawn across uh, the surface of the material that you're measuring uh, the height of. And as uh, that tip moves up and down, uh, the height of the film is recorded. And uh, surface contact profilometers can measure features as small as around a micron, uh, or excuse me, an angstrom, uh, all the way up to a couple uh, microns uh, thick. And uh, you can use it to measure surface uh, topology uh, to measure step heights and measure uh, thin film, thin film uh, thicknesses. So the instrument uh, that Rich is using uh, right now is uh, from Bruker, and uh, he's put the microscope slide in on top of uh, the gray metal disc that's kind of at the center. And directly above that, below the Bruker logo, uh, that's the uh, stylus, which is going to be dragged across the surface. And you can see in the little right hand image, uh, the thing with the little red kind of ball on it, right below that, uh, that is the uh, tip of the stylus. And when uh, that stylus is dragged across the surface, its uh, change in height is measured and uh, recorded by uh, the machine. So uh, Rich, we about ready uh, to see if we got any uh, thin film thickness there? Yep, I've got it all set up, lined up. And if you want, I can share the screen of the profilometer. Yep, so this is our, this is our profilometer. This profilometer here is, um, like few people like to refer to that, to this one is the smart one, because we actually have three of them. We have two that are all manual adjustments and to get everything lined up. This one is motorized so that we can apply this to remote sessions where somebody could actually use this from an office, a classroom, or a laboratory that that isn't here. So that's what this one's all about. So this is the one I decided to hook up here because it has it has the zoom on it because we do that with it. So just a, a real quick this one's page here, this line on the on the left. That is where we can put the settings for um, like the first one at the top here for 6.5 micrometers that is 
we're, we're trying to guess and have an idea what our height is. We can change that to a couple different settings for that purpose. Here we can put in the length, which I'm not gonna do 2000 micrometers because we're just gonna get a, a step height here. So I'm gonna change this to say 500 micrometers and I'm gonna do it and let's do it in 15 seconds. And um, the last number there is a bit of force we can put down. We can change that a little bit to, to increase the force, but since we're doing a hard surface here, it should be just fine. So with those settings done, I'm ready to roll. I'll just give you one little brief look over here on the right hand side is how we can position things. So in here, you, in this window on the, on the right, you just grab the, the red dot and the top one moves you left and right, front to back. The bottom one turns the stage so we can line up and be, be where we want to be to make our measurement. So in the middle of the screen, you see the red crosshairs. We want to make sure we're above the horizontal one with what we want to measure, which I am. Here's the line I want to start at. But we don't want to be too far away. We just want to give ourselves a little baseline before we hit the step height. And then we can measure a feature. Here, we're just going to measure a height and see what we get. So I believe we're ready. So if I hit the little play button up in the upper left, it'll do its thing. I can close the lid. And let's see what it gives us. Hopefully, everything will stay on the screen. We don't have to make any weird changes. Nope, we're pretty good. So you can see here, we have a lot of bouncing around. That's because since we did this at rough vacuum, we had a lot of objects still in our chamber that is going to get caught in our deposition as, as we uh, evaporate the, the metal. So now I'll show what we can do here. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get my R and my M cursors on the same plane to create myself a zero level. Here we go. So now I can move around and get an idea of what we deposited. So I'll take it back here where it levels off to zero. And it looks like we have deposited 371 nanometers of material. Quite a, but, uh, quite a bit of material for those two clips. And I actually reused the tungsten um, wire for a second time. So it was a little bit of aluminum on there too. Plus, I don't think I've ever really had it powered up this long. I wanted to see if I powered it up a little bit longer than, than uh, you know, usually the first few are like, oh no, <laughs> maybe we should turn it down and not try to go crazy. But this time I let it set a little longer. Maybe we ran it for maybe 20 seconds or, or so. And we got a nice thick deposit of aluminum. So that's pretty neat to know. That's it. Any questions? That was a great demo, Rich. Uh, does anyone have any questions either about thermal evaporation or about how Rich did this thin film thickness um, measurement? Um, the, um, uh, the precision of the measurements that you mentioned, was that specifically referring just to the z-axis or is that also in the xy directions? That's the, the z-axis, but my um, my uh, stage is moving so that I can run my probe across the surface to get that that height measurement. So what, what kind of resolution do you have uh, as you're scanning across? Uh, that varies. The, the The resolution here, well, my my tip is twelve and a half. Um, micrometers in size. So I have a relatively large tip on here. It's a standard tip that comes with this. But if it, you can get different size tips, I believe down to like 50 nanometers to take small 
or narrow measurements of items. And so it can get down in, into a relative, well, we've got nanometers here, so we can get down into, I'm, I'm thinking, I think it said, uh, one slide said like 0.6 or six nanometers or something like that. So this has a pretty good resolution. Um, there are other items out there, the AFM, uh, atomic force mi mi microscope. Um, I don't know if there's a talk on that, but that is for really getting down to the nanometer and sub nanometer type areas. Uh, uh, this is mostly for height measurements and length. Uh, the AFM can give you a really good small topography. Uh, we also have in our lab here an optical uh, profilometer, which is, is kind of neat. And that can get down in a nanometer resolution too. So is the profilometer just scanning along one dimension? Yes, just the surface. But it's like the AFM, we would sort of do like line after line, but it, the profilometer just do, does one line? Yes, yes. The, the, the AFM is like a rastering uh, device. Okay, thank you. And uh, th both of those, well, actually, the AFM can do non-contact and contact mode. This only has contact with the surface, this, this profilometer. And then the optical we have has no contact with the surface. It uses light and interference of light waves to determine the height of objects and its view. Any other questions, either over a microphone or over chat? Good. Good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, finish up uh, talking about three different classes of thermal evaporation um, instruments, and then um, we'll uh, uh, wrap up uh, kind of with a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So Rich mentioned earlier that the evaporation that you saw was a very low cost option, uh, but there are kind of three classes of uh, thermal evaporators if you're uh, considering purchasing one. Uh, so Rich, up here, we've got the uh, commercial thermal evaporator. Uh, how's this kind of different than uh, your setup and what's kind of like ballpark cost for these sorts of things? Okay, let me get this out of the way. Everybody's face, okay. So this one here is uh, one of Kurt Lesker's I guess you would say this is more of a commercial high-end research type device. So this is what you might see in a laboratory. And this is probably going to be, you know, maybe I want to say a hundred to $200,000 and probably on the lower end for this one um, and uh, manufacturing ones. If you ever seen them or just, they're huge and they're millions. Um, so this one here, it also has a, you can see in the middle there between the controls and the chamber, it has a, a way to get the device that you the object you want your sample to coat without having to change your chamber to shut it down and open the door. Everything stays sealed shut. You put your device, your sample inside the box, transfer it inside your evacuated chamber and do your business. So that's one way to keep it repet repetition going quickly without having delays. Mm, that's it. So if we uh, step down in cost, uh, then uh, what do we get and about how much are these? Here is what we had Lesker make us. We had, uh, this is their low cost uh, thermal evaporator, but it's even made lower cost at our request. We wanted a thermal evaporator to had more things for our students to operate. So you can see we have a lot of knobs. This one's not connected to a computer. It's not just connected to um, just that like front uh, thickness monitor or anything. So this one here ran us around thirty five thousand uh, dollars. Typically, this would be more like if they did it for a low cost one for, I don't know, I guess a university this could be say about $50,000. So we, we cut the cost down, 
but we made it more manual. So our students had more to learn. So that's what we ended up with us. Uh, so let's show yours again and uh, remind us uh, the cost of this uh, lowest cost thermal evaporator. So yeah, this one, uh, as our chart showed before, we have about a $5,000 investment here. And it could be cut down a little bit more by different gauge that's on there and, and a couple other things and maybe a different size pump. Uh, that's some of the stuff we would hope to investigate more in the future so that we can actually come up with a detailed thing to say, well, here you go. If you want to add this to a class, this is what it's going to cost. And we, we got it down for you. <laughs> Great. So Rich and I are really excited about this idea of low cost thermal evaporation and bringing a high tech, uh, high tech technique uh, like thermal evaporation to community and technical colleges. So in the summer of 2022, we're planning on uh, running a low cost thermal evaporator professional development workshop. Uh, and if you attend, uh, you could go home back to your college uh, with a low cost thermal evaporator uh, that you can uh, use with your students. Uh, we don't have like a sign up page uh, yet. It's not going to be for um, until uh, not this summer 2021, but uh, 2022, where we hopefully can all be in person. Uh, but if you uh, like this idea and you're excited about doing uh, thermal evaporation. We'd uh, love for you to uh, join us. So um, uh, this sort of uh, finishes the content. Uh, before we uh, get into the housekeeping, uh, any other uh, questions for either me or Rich about thermal evaporation? Well, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much, Peter and Rich. Um, uh, you did a fabulous job. Hopefully it was beneficial to all of our attendees. And so we will actually then officially close the session today. So thanks again, Peter and, and, uh, and Rich.